This is the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. I'm Chris Lambert. And I'm Josh Havens. We're on a journey to learn what it means to live a lifestyle of discipleship. We're glad you're joining us today and hope that as you set aside this time for God, that He will help you grow today in the everyday moments of life. What does it mean to live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? In today's chapter, Chris finishes his message from Philippians 1. Paul's relationship with the Philippians was special to him, and his concern for them comes out in the way Chris describes what Paul is calling them to do. In the same way, Jesus calls you to live your life today in a way that is worthy of the gift he's given you. Like I said, there's a lot that we could go into the rest of this first half of the the passage, but I want to jump through some of that fairly quickly and get to the second part, because I think this is what Paul is ultimately wrestling with. He's He's using his circumstances, he's using his trial, he's connecting them together in order to give them this charge. Really here in verse 27, this is Paul's thesis statement for the rest of the letter. This is where it's at. He, again, changes his tone. It's still on the Philippians now more than ever, and he begins to give them a direct imperative. He starts off with saying only, and this is kind of a bad translation. It really, a better way of saying this is regardless of what happens to me. So again, let me just read the last few uh, verses up to that. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ because of my coming to you again. But regardless of what happens to me, let the manner of your life Be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let your manner of life. Again, in an unfortunate constraint of our translation and our language, the strong imperative that Paul is using here is lost in the phrasing of let the manner of your life. Josh kind of told me that he teased this at the men's breakfast already, but this word is, is, is unique for Paul, and this is where I could really just start talking and we'd be here for a while. But um, this is a unique word. Paul, again, charges other churches and other letters to let their life reflect, and this gets translated very similarly. But this is only one of two instances of this word um, being used in the New Testament, and it's the only time that Paul uses it. And it's called, it, the, the word is polituesta, and it comes from the root of polis where we get our word politics from. It's deeply political in what this word is connoting. And again, as Chase set us up last week, he talked about the Philippian colony, and these were a proud people, proud to be from Rome, many of which probably had ancestors or direct connection to the military might of Rome. They could be called up at any moment. They would have had a proud history and heritage of this. So evoking a political a word like this in their minds and for their unique situation, I think, would probably be but like me saying to you guys to take up your patriotic heritage as kingdom citizens of God. Let your actions be patriotic for the kingdom of heaven. And we invoke all of the, the imagery that we normally have as good patriotic Americans. And, and, and all of that imagery kind of gets transposed onto the pride, the joy, the honor that we should be put into our identities as citizens of this new kingdom that Paul is talking about, that Christ has inaugurated. It's unlikely, though, that many of the Philippian church uh, members would have had Roman citizenship. Sure, some would have, um, but many would have been trying to attain it because of the benefits that it would accompany them. Paul is trying to get his audience, though, to raise their sights to a higher or prior kind of citizenship which includes all of them, not just the elite few. Thus, it would be full of meaning in the light of their privileged status as Roman citizens, now addressing them as to their civic responsibilities to the new polis, the new city, the believing community of which they are a part, whose responsibilities will be spelled out in what Paul goes on to say. It's not that he says that they should renounce their Roman citizenship. Obviously, Paul's in the situation that he's in right now because of his Roman citizenship. It's something, it's, it's a tool that can be used, I think, and we've seen that uh, uh, with Chase preaching through Acts and the way that, that Paul utilized it in certain uh, key strategic 
situations. And so I'm not, I don't want to get into the, uh, the issue of, is he saying like renounce it all or, or do anything? He's just simply trying to get them to look at the higher citizenship here in this case. To summarize, I'll simply say that Paul was talking about a different kind of citizenship. This new citizenship radically restructures their way of life. They were no longer to act or react the way the world does. As the context makes clear, the standard against which this ordering takes place is not Rome or Jewish law. It is the gospel of Christ. Therefore, Paul uses this word to evoke certain presuppositional, again, think the the grand patriotic, I always think of the 4th of July, our annual time of remembering, those presuppositions about the moral and ethical obligations that they have, and then redefines them based on the gospel. Paul does not set up a dualistic ideology of citizenship, being both a good citizen according to the world and to heaven. Their entire identities have been changed so that their conduct is now in regards to how they live according to the gospel. Their conduct is to be based on that which is worthy of the gospel. Ultimately, this becomes the reasons for all that Paul exhorts the Philippians to do. Their identity rests in Christ. Therefore, their lives should reflect such. What follows this statement, and it's the rest of the sentence basically that he goes on, becomes Paul's outline for what this conduct looks like. Ultimately, the, the ultimate Christian living in Christ's life is the paradigm that we, we will get to see in a week or two when uh, we cover Philippians 2, 5 through 11. The emptying of Christ, what that looks like, will ultimately become the answer to what this question is of how we walk and live a life worthy of the gospel. But we're not there, we're here. So if the manner of our life is to be one of political subversion, again, thinking not primarily about our citizenship here, but thinking of what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, of letting the gospel and the life of Jesus influence the way that we live our lives as a way of living as citizens, sojourners on this earth. The adverb worthy helps us understand the specific, the specific behavior that we are to embody. And what I love most about Paul and the way that he lives and writes is that his motives in theology are so well thought through that his own life becomes a demonstration of the point that he's trying to make. For Paul, the gospel is not something that we should simply know, to hear and do nothing with. No. When the gospel penetrates our hearts, it calls us to action, a new way of life. And we can see what kind of life this is through the struggle that Paul has recounted in the first part of the passage, as well as in the specific exhortations that he gives the Philippian church. They are to stand together in one spirit, just as the Philippians are unified with Paul in participating in his suffering through the help of the Spirit, so they are to also stand together in their own context. They are to remain bold as they face their enemies, just as Paul must stand before a Roman tribunal and give a bold account of what Jesus has done, so they must face their own enemies and persecutors. For facing them with boldness is... For facing them with boldness and love is actually a sign that the gospel is at work amongst them and will be used to bring about God's purpose of salvation in the world. And finally, they suffer for Christ as living sacrifices offered up for the glory of Christ. For no other way of walking, no other way of conducting life is as powerful a witness than that of a life poured out in suffering for others. This is what Christ did as he went to the cross. He poured out his life for us so that we might have life and joy in him. And it seems a strange thing that we could have both joy and suffering in tandem. But as we have seen the effects of the gospel play out in Paul's life throughout the book of Acts, it is only because of his firm identity in the person of Jesus Christ that this could possibly happen. 
to partake in his identity is our ultimate purpose. And part of his identity is the crucified Christ. So God is not concerned with squashing our fun or dictating our behavior out of some control-free desire. He is concerned with our identities, who we are. And so if we are to follow Christ and be born again, remade into the image of God, who is Christ Jesus, our identities must change. This call that Christ puts before us is one of death. For we cannot change our identities without letting go of the ones we currently hold. When we think about dying to ourselves, we say that phrase a lot. I've got to die to myself. But what does that mean? Is that actually, again, is, is it suicide? A lot of people in the early church actually thought that maybe Jesus was talking about this. Or, you know, you have to partake in my blood. And it's actually some sort of like blood magic or sacrifices that they were partaking in. But when we look at our identities and we're called to lay our lives down as living sacrifices, Paul was in the midst of saying whether he's going to live or whether he's going to die. Most of us are not in the situation of having to face bodily death and see our lives vindicated through that death. But every day we must walk as living sacrifices and lay down our own natural desires. The things that we want, so desperately want, and we struggle with it because it seems so good. And why wouldn't God want me to have fun or pleasure or enjoy the good life? It almost seems that for me to lay that down would be to lose a part of myself because it's it's so deeply ingrained in who I am. It's so deep into my heart. But I think that's the purpose, is that when we realize that that is that much a part of us, the only way that we could get rid of that, to lay that down and go contrary to where our natural flesh, our natural desires would pull us is because it requires us to die. It feels like death, like we're letting go of a part of ourselves. And indeed, I think we are. That's why we must join in Christ's death through baptism and his resurrection to be raised in the power of that. Otherwise, we can't let go of one identity and walk in another. And as we all know, this isn't instant. It's not, okay, I... I got baptized. I no longer struggle. It's a daily living sacrifice where we give of ourselves and we feel that death daily. Jesus did not die to save us so that we could go on living the good life. Instead, when Jesus calls us to follow him as his disciples, he calls us to carry our crosses. And while it's easy for us to kind of dismiss or scoff at the disciples for missing the significance of that reference when Jesus gave them that charge at the time. I believe we have even more guilt when we miss it because we have the entire story written before us and yet it seems we still miss the implications of Jesus' call. Our call to follow Jesus will result in the sacrificial death of ourselves. Not that our deaths will bring about salvation of others in the way that Christ did. Although, as we sacrificially lay our lives down for the sake of the gospel, our death becomes the means for others to see and hear the gospel and thereby accept Christ. Our lives are to be lived as living sacrifices to glorify God. Our lives are embodied. We live them in these physical bodies, in a world that was created by God. We experience God. Yet we must live embodied lives while dying to our own desires. We must literally give up those things, those ideals, those people, those aspirations, those desires, those pleasures, those privileges, those rights, and those pursuits that we want most in order to pursue the way of Christ. For his way, the gospel, his very life is what defines proper conduct as citizens in his kingdom. Paul has formed a vision of the gospel that reaches through the entire history of of God with his people to show that the gospel fundamentally transforms our lives and is deeply practical for the way in which we live. It takes all of who we are to walk in it and even more. We cannot do it alone. Only by standing with one another in unity and in the Holy Spirit can we hope to conduct ourselves as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
What does it mean to live for Christ as a kingdom citizen worthy of the gospel? Because I can't ever decide on one definition, I'll just read you two of the three. To glorify him through the sacrifices of our daily lives is they are lived for him. Christ's life becomes our life. The way in which he lived his life, a life that ultimately led to the cross, dictates the way in which we live ours. If you take away one thing from this message, I hope it's the recognition that as a Christian, you live primarily as a citizen of the kingdom of God. If you've ever been to another country other than your own, you know what it's like to feel like you're not at home anymore. You can feel out of place knowing that the culture around you is totally different than what you're used to. I want to challenge you today to see your life as a Christian this way. When you join the kingdom of God, your primary citizenship and culture became the citizenship and culture of his kingdom. Understanding this, in light of what Jesus did for us, completely changes our view of the way we live in the everyday moments of life. Thanks for listening to the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with everything that's happening at Daily Growth, go to dailygrowthdiscipleship.com and subscribe for free. Or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Oh, 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 oh